There really is a lot going on, and we think it's, uh, there are a lot of significant things going on. So yes, you will get an hour of sleep next week. Um, the 9.30 was the largest ever on that Sunday last year. And so if you, especially if, if you wake up early, come on, we'll, we'll have services, normal time. Um, but it will be darker earlier, just so everyone's clear on that. There's a lot going on. I mean, we're one win away from the World Series. Come on. Come on. And so it's fun to see those that sometimes come at 6 o'clock come into the two morning services like, yeah, Tim and I are going to have a blast tonight at the 6 o'clock service. We'll find some way to pipe this thing in or we'll take church down to the bar and watch the game or something like that. You guys come on in. Um, we, won't, we won't really do that. Hey, there, there is a lot going on just in life and sports and time change and a lot of big things at Epic. And, and then I also know that a lot of you uh, have family and friends probably uh, that are in the, the potential path of this destructive thing called Sandy on the East Coast. Anybody like you got friends you're concerned about. Hey, why don't you just stand up, uh, kind of representing your friends. I want to pray for uh, all of our friends that are in that path. Just stand up. Just rep- if you have people you know on the East Coast, and it just looks like it's not going to be a, 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 a fun thing for them the next couple of days, let's, let's pray um, for God. My main prayer is, yeah, that God would um, spare uh, anybody we know but everyone from, from that destruction. So let's pray, and then, and then we'll get into the, te- the message for today. God, we... Uh, we, we know weather can be this tremendous, tremendously destructive thing. And, and God, at the same time, we believe that you have all authority. We believe that um, nothing happens without your knowledge or you at least allowing it to happen. So, God, we want to pray for everyone, especially represented by those we're standing for today. God, our friends, our family, maybe some of us have property back um, in that area. God, I just pray that you give them wisdom to get out when it's time to get out, and especially if that's right now. God, I pray you would protect um, all of those individuals. God, I pray especially the people um, that are represented by those standing this morning. God, I pray you would spare them from harm. And um, God, I pray that we could see your mercy uh, in in this situation over the next several hours and days. Um, Just your mercy, God. Things look like they're going to get pretty bad. So I just pray that we would see your hand in this. And uh, God, that we see your hand, period. I'd, I'd love to see your hand of mercy as you spare the people we really care about a lot over the next several days. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll continue to end. Let's pray for, uh, for, for what's going on over, over there. Um, hey, you picked a great reason to come to church this morning, specifically this church. Uh, hopefully you're at the right church, Epic. Uh, everybody clear? You can't get out if you're not at the right church. But, um, and you'll, you'll know why that's funny in a minute. One of the reasons I'm glad that you came to church today is because we're going to look at a story that you would literally think, if someone gave you the details of the story, you would think there's no way they'll ever tell me that story at church. Right? Some of you have this idea like, oh, the church, the Bible's boring church. Let, let me tell you, this is like Hollywood script style story. This is better than The Bachelor, better than Desperate Housewives, all right? And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, especially fellas, if you watch Bachelor or Bachelorette. We're not going there uh, because you'll think I'm looking at you, then you'll feel guilty, and then you'll, re- well, you should. Uh, not really. Um, but in this story that we're going to look at from the Bible of all places, uh, it's a story that, that's got uh, crazy things that people do for love, right? That makes a great love story, doesn't it? it it's got a, a father-in-law that's um, pretty deceitful. Um, that makes for a good love story, unless you're the one involved. Um, it, it's got a, a man who's married to two women at the same time who are sisters. This is good, huh? I mean, you're like, there's no way that's in the Bible. Yeah, that's in the Bible. We're about to, we're about to get into it. And, and it's just Hollywood script. Like, we should really read our Bibles more. It's full of high drama. It's stories about old heroes and young heroes. There's love in the Bible. There's this uh, evil. There's good. There's tension. I mean, you really, uh, the Bible is an incredible um, collection of, of, of things that have been written together. And so I just want to encourage you to read that, first of all. And this morning, it is an amazing story. So the story begins with a guy named Abraham. Perhaps you're familiar with him or if, if not, at least from a biblical account, anybody ever been in preschool or had kids and the, the whole Father Abraham song? Anybody? And there's a reason. That actually comes from the Bible. Imagine that. And, and so the reason why he's called Father Abraham is because God promised Abraham that he would have as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. That's a lot, okay? You don't see them if you live in downtown, but there are a lot out there, they tell us. And so God promises him. Well, the only problem is Abraham's in his 90s and his wife Sarah's in her 80s and they have no kids and he's supposed to have many, many grand, 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 grand children. And they got nothing, right? Well, by the time Abraham's 100 and his wife is 90, finally little Isaac comes into the world, which is an amazing story. And you can follow Isaac's story, uh, especially in Genesis chapter 21 and chapter 22. Um, It's an amazing story. And then Isaac marries Rebekah. And then Isaac and Rebekah have children. And one of their kids' names is Jacob. 
And that's the story I want to talk to you about today. And you'll, we'll pick it up in a few minutes. Um, so, so Jacob, he eventually goes to work for a relative named Laban. Anybody ever worked for a relative before? I just raise your hands high, so I, I want to kind of figure some things out here. Um, did they overpay you or underpay you in general? Under? Anybody over? Over? Didn't pay. Didn't pay. <laughs> yeah, you're going to relate to this guy. So Jacob begins working for his relative Laban, and, and Laban realizes, like, oh, man, you're doing a lot of work, and I'm not giving you anything. And so Laban says to Jacob, he says to him, what, basically, what should I pay you? What should your wages be? Don't you wish you had a boss that would just ask you that open-ended question? Isn't that a great question? What do you think I should pay you? What are you worth? I mean, what, what, what should we pay you? And, and so Jacob begins to get creative. Now, before I tell you what Jacob got for his payment, what his, wage, what, what his wages were, I want you to understand that Laban had two daughters. The oldest one was named Leah. The youngest one was named Rachel. And I want you to see what the, it actually says in the Bible about these two daughters. Any, any girls have sisters? Any of you ladies have sisters? Raise your hand. Did you ever get compared to them? All right, let's we'll see if your comparison went like this. Here we go. Genesis 29, 17. Leah is the older. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Comparisons, anybody? Now, just so you know, it's not saying that Leah had bad eyesight. If so, it would read like this. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel's eyes were strong. Right? Everybody on the same page? What it's saying, essentially, one of two things, probably Leah's eyes were weak, meaning she was probably cross-eyed or she was just simply unsightly to look at. All right. Rachel, beautiful in form and appearance. When the guys met this family, how do you think that went down usually? Come on, fellas. Everything else being equal, of course. So when it comes time for Jacob to answer Laban's question, what should your wages be? He says this, I'll work for you for seven years in exchange for your daughter. Which one is it going to be? Come on. Some things haven't changed in thousands of years, have they? Uh, This is obvious. I don't fault the man. I mean, listen, he's going to, he, he says, I'm going to work seven years. Now, what's crazy, seven years of wages for Jacob, it was nearly four times the price of an average bride. Four times the price an average husband would pay for his bride. So just know, it's not like that's everyone in the culture is working seven years for their wives. Uh, Men, have you ever met a woman you would, a woman you would work seven years for? Every married man better get their hand up and better do so quickly. We got one guy that got it right here. Guys, I'm going to go one more time. We're just going to do over. Pretend like you didn't hear that. Men who are married. Have you ever met a woman that you would work at least seven years for? All right. All right. All right. And ladies, you can tell the truth. Have you ever met a man you would work seven years for? Uh, All right. And so he says to, to Laban, I will work seven years, but the deal is my wages are you have to give me Rachel as a wife. And so he works in, and here's Jacob. So there's a few people, there's a lot of people that are messed up in this story. You will really think bachelor-ish, desperate housewife's like when we get through with this thing. It's crazy, um, except for the redemption part at the end. It's crazy. Um, and, and what Jacob wants, he believes, his relationship deal, the tell me who I am theme, because um, he believes that if he gets Rachel, then it'll essentially solve all his problems. If he gets Rachel to use modern day language, she will complete him. She, she will give him something to live for. It'll, it'll finally be there for him. That's Jacob's relational deal. Remember, if we look to a relationship like any of these other things we talked about, tell me who I am, right? Um, all of us look to someone or something to tell us who we are, and then we live out of that identity. Uh, but when we look to a person or to a relationship with a person to tell us who we are, uh, then we think that, that we've got to have that. Otherwise, our life will somehow be incomplete. And that's where Jacob is. He's willing to do whatever. Well, here's where it goes all Hollywood-like. Well, first, let me say this. Genesis 29, 20. You'll see this on the screen. It says, so Jacob served seven years. He did his time. He did his job. He served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. I mean, she must have been something else. The guy worked 2,500 days, and he said it seemed like a few days. It seemed like a few days. So his time's there. And, and to use, he used pretty strong language once he was done working for Laban seven years. He essentially said to Laban, um, it's time for you to give your daughter to me. It was really that direct and that straightforward in that Hebrew, that original Hebrew text, that, uh, language that it was written in. So the time comes. It is the wedding night. Seven years of work down the drain. It's the wedding night. And wouldn't you know it, Laban, rather than giving Rachel to Jacob, Laban gives Leah. 
And what's wild is that Jacob doesn't realize it till the next morning. We're not, this is not a premarital counseling thing, but let me just give you a piece of it, okay? Men and women, take a candle at least on your honeymoon, okay? <laughs> the last thing you want to do is get up the next morning and realize, oh, crap, that's not the person I thought it was. That would be terrible, right? And so at least, at least get the candle so you know what's going on. Laban... And obviously they were very veiled, so in the series, the, the natural instinct we have is, how in the world would you not know? But obviously the bride was very veiled, obviously, right? And, and remember this, Jacob, um, without getting into more details than we need to, Jacob had waited seven years, okay? All right, just whatever you need to do with that. Um, and so he wasn't, I don't know, he just didn't seem to be concerned with figuring out, making sure it was Rachel. He just assumed that it was. He wakes up the next morning, and the way the Bible says it is like this. It says, and behold, the next morning it was Leah. Have you ever been duped by anyone? Anybody ever been scammed by someone on Craigslist besides your pastor? Anyone ever? Anyone ever paid $2,000 for sports tickets and they never arrived? Is that just me? Is that Bueller? Anybody? Anybody? Have you ever been scammed by anyone? Have you ever thought you were getting one thing and then you got something completely different? Imagine Jacob. He is working 2,500 days for this woman, Rachel. He's got to have her. He'll do whatever it takes to have her. Gets to the wedding night, wakes up the next morning and realizes it's Leah. And so he strikes a deal again with Laban, which blows my mind. He enters into basically another contract with Laban and says, Hey, I'll work seven additional years. And after that, I want you to give me Rachel. So he's married to Leah, right? And do you know why Laban deceived Jacob? Because Laban knew the same thing that Leah knew, that no one was ever going to, of their own volition and desire, choose Leah. No one was ever going to pick Leah. He had seen the girls grow up. He saw them hit puberty, saw the guys flocking to Rachel. He knew no one was ever going to choose Leah. She would never be valuable enough for someone to love her. She would, never, she would never have the goods. No one would ever choose her. We've got to figure out a way to get her married off. The only way to do that is to make some man think that they're going to be marrying Rachel. And so Jacob marries Leah, but then he works another seven years, and he marries Rachel. Hollywood script, isn't it? I mean, guys, how difficult and complicated would it be, married to, would it be to be married to two women? The guys that are married, again, should say, very difficult, Pastor. Impossible. Not only married to two different women at the same time, but married to two different women who were sisters. How were the holidays? Imagine the holidays. Like, um, can we, or we're going in the family van. Which one? I mean, what, what's going on here? I mean, there's crazy drama with Leah and Rachel. Jacob's married to both of them. And while he's married to both of them, he doesn't love both of them, does he? And they all know it. And it's great for Jacob and it's seemingly great for Rachel. But it's not great for Leah. But she's married to him. And so Leah begins to think what all of us think when we're trying to get our identity from a relationship that we're in or that we wish we were in. Here's what she begins to think. I've got to figure out a way to increase my value in his eyes so that he'll love me. I've got to figure out a way to increase my value in his eyes so that he will love me. And so she begins this quest. Now, in a minute, I'm going to have a stand up and we're going to read what she does to increase her value to get his love. It's very probably different than what we would do in 2012, but we do things too, don't we? Some of us do it to add up so our parents will finally love us. Some of us do it so we'll finally get the promotion. But when it comes to relationships, many of us try to figure out a way to increase our value so we'll finally get the person that we believe will change everything for us to notice us, value us, and then cause them to love us out of this. So I want you to turn to, if you have a Bible, Genesis chapter 29. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We've got many, many volunteers that are, uh, that are passing those out. Just raise your hand if you need a Bible. This morning, just for you to follow along, if you receive one of those Bibles, we're on page 16. For the rest of us, Genesis is the first book in the Bible, chapter 29, and we will, um, we will start in verse 31. Would you guys stand with me? The, the verses will be on the screen as well. Genesis 29, verses 31 through 34. And here's what I want. You're going to see what she seeks out to do, what her quest is full of. But think it through this lens. Anyone who looks to a relationship or someone to find their value and identity, we will do whatever it takes to raise our value so that we can get their love. Okay, just keep that in mind. Here's what she does. Verse 31 through 34. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. 
And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. You may be seated. You see what's happening? Leah longs to be chosen. Um, She desires to be wanted. She desperately wants to be loved. And so she must figure out a way to increase her value in Jacob's eyes. Now, again, you might think, ladies or men, we might not think that children would be the way to increase value, depending on what your thoughts are on that. But we, we do things in 2012 just like this. Just like this. We figure out a way to increase our value, to try to discover some identity, so that the other person, whether we're in a relationship with them or whether we simply want to be in a relationship with them, we do it so that our value will increase, and then they will love us in response to our value increasing. Look at 32. She thinks she's finally discovered something that will do it when she starts having children. In 32, she says, for now my husband will love me. For now, I've finally done something. I've done something performance-wise. I've done something good enough. I'm finally going to measure up. I'm going to present him with this child, and he is going to love me. I'm going to increase my value. He's going to increase his love towards me. But one son didn't do it, did it? So she has another, and she has another, and then in verse 34, another. And she says, now this time my husband will be attached to me. This time my husband will be attached to me. To me, is it possible that we're looking to a relationship to tell us who we are? And again, as we've said all along, it doesn't mean that we have to have a present relationship. It could be one that we're seeking. It could be one that we long for, and we're looking for that to tell us who we are. If you look to a relationship or the person in that relationship to tell you who you are, remember this, you'll do whatever it takes. You will not care how they treat you. You you will not care what they ask of you. It, It won't matter that you have to give up where you live or you have to give up your career or that you have to give up your dreams or that you even have to give up your faith. When relationship is the dominant thing in our lives, we'll do anything for it. Because as I introduced you guys to a few weeks ago, the master principle is always true when it comes to identity. And here's the master principle. Whatever becomes the primary source of giving us our identity... This always wins over everything else. Whatever becomes the primary source of giving us our identity, it always wins over whatever else. So if your work life is a thing that gives you your identity, it will always win over family. It will always win even over money. If relationships are the thing, though, that give you your identity, and that's how you derive who you are and a sense of value and a sense of self, and this is my identity, the master principle is always true. The relationship thing will always win. So you, I, I know people, this is so sad to me, but I know people that have given up their dreams because of a relationship. Sadder still, I know people who have walked away from their faith because of a relationship. Isn't that amazing? They claim to have this relationship with Jesus who gives us an identity not based on how we perform. And they get into a relationship based upon how they perform and they walk away from the secure identity in Christ because relationships have become the dominant thing in their life. I just want to caution you guys on that, because when, when it becomes dominant, then we'll do whatever. Uh, turn over just one chapter to chapter 30, verses 19 and 20 of Genesis 30. She's still going on for it. She's still at it. She's still on this quest. Listen to what it says. Like, she just doesn't get it. Three kids wasn't enough. Four kids aren't enough. Verse 19, and Leah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Do you see how the quest never ends? I mean, and isn't it amazing when you're not in the relationship how much wisdom you can give to the person in the relationship? Right? But when you're in it, you're like, I don't see, I don't see the red flags. I don't, but when we're outside the perspective, like if you, were, if you were Leah's friend, wouldn't you be able to sit down and go, sweetheart, when you had the first son, that didn't do it. 
When you had kid number three, your value didn't go up in his eyes. When you had the fifth child, but yet Leah, she's been pregnant a total of 54 months with these six kids. And you have to think that every single day, because by the first one, right, every time she's pregnant again, she's also got a toddler, a newborn, and she's rocking those kids. She's, she's nursing those kids, and she's thinking every single day of every one of those 54 months, maybe this child will be the one that finally does it for me. Maybe this will be the one that finally increases my value in Jacob's eyes and he finally loves me. What else do I have to do? And she's on this never ending quest. And some of you are too. No, I know you're not trying to have six kids. I get that. But you're on a quest. If identity is found in your relational status. You and I are on a quest if we're finding our identity in our relational status. We've got to measure up. We've got to perform well enough. And she's going, hey, my sixth son is going to make him finally honor me. Remember, if relationships are the thing that give you your identity, give me my identity, you and I will never do enough. Right? When was enough going to be enough? Twelve kids? Surgery on our face? When was enough going to be enough? Because here's the deal. Whatever you and I find our identity in outside of Jesus himself, enough is never enough. If I find my identity in pastoring a growing church, when is enough enough? 500? 1,000? Never. When it comes to relationships, enough is never enough because you're not always going to get it right. And imagine the weight and pressure you have to live with if your value, your, 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 like at the core of your being, if your value is determined by how you perform and what your value is uh, to other human beings, you're, you're, never going to, you're never going to get it right. And so the question this morning may be, well, Ben, if this is true, why should people even ever consider marriage, right? And some of us have walked away from that because it didn't give us what we thought it promised to give us. Or some relationship, or maybe you've been married before and it didn't give. So you're like, oh, marriage is terrible. So why marriage? Here's why I would say why marriage. And we have a video that you can watch from our last 2.0 experience. Just go online and, and there's about two to three hours worth of content there for, for marriage. But here's why I think why marriage. I, I believe when it comes to human to human relationships, not human to God, but human to human relationships. I believe that God designed for marriage to be the most life giving relationship between two humans. If you disagree, I'll fight you and tell you you're wrong. But I believe, I'm not saying it always happens. In fact, sadly enough, it usually doesn't happen. I don't think. But I believe in God's intention and God's design that we talk a lot about around here at Epic. I believe he designed the human-human marriage relationship to be the most life-giving relationship between any two humans. I believe that. And so it's beautiful and it goes really well when you have two humans who know who they are in Christ. Their identity is secured. They're not coming into marriage seeking an identity. That's already been um, given in Jesus without their performance, right? Which is incredible. We'll talk about that in a second. Imagine how life-giving that relationship is when they both know where their identity is and they don't have to find it in each other or give it to each other. Pretty life-giving, isn't it? Now imagine the same two people enter into marriage looking for an identity. Instead of it being a life-giving relationship, it actually sucks the life out of them, doesn't it? And then when marriage goes bad, there's no worse relationship between two humans as far as things that suck the life out of us, is there? Why marriage? Because not to gain an identity, but to give life, to to live out the design of God. And it's a beautiful thing when my wife, um, she, she doesn't have to feel the pressure of serving the God role for me. You're like, what do you mean, Ben? Do you, does she have a throne? No, she doesn't have a throne, but a lot of people are in relationships and they allow a man or a woman to sit on the throne of their lives and whatever that man or woman needs, whatever that man or woman dictates, that's what they live out. They find their, their identity in that and there's this great weight and pressure. Shauna and I have a great friend right now who's in a very struggling marriage and we spent time with her recently and, and it was amazing to see the growth in her own life. She said, you know what? This marriage is bad right now. I want it to get better. Um, I, I pray, praying that he'll come around. I am praying that he'll live out his commitment to me. I, I am praying for this thing to go well. But then it was amazing what she said after that. She said, as much as I want it to go well, and as much as I'll be disappointed if it doesn't, that's not where my identity is anymore. Now, some of you may go, man, that's terrible. No, she's, 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 she's playing out the cards right. She's a committed wife. She's loving him even when he's not lovely. She's wanting the marriage to be reconciled and redeemed. But she was able to say, but even if he walks away for good, he will not take away my identity. 
I love the relationship. I want it to go well. But my identity is a place that's more secure than my marriage. Some of you go, Ben, how is that possible? It's got to be possible. Sean, I cannot play the God role in my life. Can you imagine the weight she would have to carry if I looked to her for everything I need? Now, I get a lot from her, and it's beautiful. It's great. But if she had to carry the God role in my life, don't make people carry that role in your life. And let people know that you need to be freed from carrying that role in their life. Jacob and Leah had two very different problems, but probably every one of us who look to relationships to find our identity, we probably have one of the two problems. Jacob's issue was this. He thought that if he got into the relationship with Rachel, it would finally do it for him. So he's looking for fulfillment. He's looking for satisfaction. He's looking for something that he doesn't currently have. Jesus came to do something about that problem. Jesus said that um, in him would be this life everlasting, would be this kind of um, uh, spring of water welling up inside of us where, where we don't get thirsty and have to keep quenching our thirst by chasing things. And Leah had her own problem though, right? She thought she had to increase her value in Jacob's eyes so that he would love her. You know how Jesus takes care of that? Let me show you Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Remember, Leah had to increase her value to get the love of Jacob. But here's, here's what Jesus does that's different than Jacob would do, that's different than I would do, that's different than the man or woman you want to be in or in relationship with right now would do. Here's what's different. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we got our act together... Before we worked those seven or then 14 years, before we gave him the sixth son, before you brought anything that God could use, God came for you. Isn't that incredible? I spent so much of my life searching for it elsewhere. I spent so much of my life trying to get my value increased in my mom and dad's eyes, and they're great parents, or increased in Shauna's eyes, or, or, or increased in a coach's eyes, whatever. I spent so much of my life trying to get my value increased so that there would be something worthwhile to love. And what Jesus says is, Ben, when your value was nothing, I died for you. Give me something better than that, and I'll take it. Show me a man or woman who will love me like that, or love you like that, and I'll take it. The reality is there isn't. We throw this word savior around and some people think that's like the spiritual word or that's this religious word or this for religious people or just for Christians. The reality is that every one of us in this room look to someone or something in our lives to be our savior. Some of you find your career to be your savior, meaning this. It gives you a sense of purpose, takes away the loneliness, fills the emptiness. Some of you look to another person to be your savior. That's going to go bad for you and for them. It's going to go bad for you because they're going to let you down. It's going to go bad for them because they're going to experience some weight and pressure that God never intended them to carry. Listen, don't, even if you're the best husband or the best wife, you still can't be God for the other person. Let me relieve you from that. Let God be God. Help them lean into God. Love them well. Play your part. Serve your role. There's a part there for us. But let's let Jesus be our Savior. Let's let Jesus give us our identity. It's stable. He's not going to change from day to day. He's not going to have an off month. You need a Savior who's like that. And I wonder, those of you in the crowd this morning, those of you especially that have looked everywhere else to find someone to love you, someone to give you something stable, someone to give you an identity, someone to say you're valuable enough to love, I wonder if you would respond in faith and follow Jesus this morning for the first time, asking him to take your sin and to be your savior. The way it worked back in this time thousands of years ago is still the way value works today. Something's value can only be determined by what someone's willing to pay for it, right? Does that make sense? Do you guys agree? So you can say that you think your house is worth a million dollars, but if nobody will pay you a million dollars, I've got sad news for you. It's not worth a million dollars, right? Same way with a car or anything else. Payment or value is determined by what some individual is willing to pay for it. So the question that leads us into unhealthy relationships is the question, am I valuable enough? Do I have value? Do I have intrinsic worth? Will someone accept me? When it comes to Jesus, if value equals payment, he paid with his life. Do you think you're valuable? Yeah, your, your worth is death on a cross, a brutal one, for a man who had done no wrong. In your stead, in your place, do you think you have some value now? I hope so. 
I hope so. And then, as Tim mentioned earlier, we've got this baptism card. There, there are some of you, I know, that it's in the last several years or in the last several months, or even maybe this morning, you've, you've made a decision to follow Jesus. Like, you're like, this is the new life. I've got this new identity. The beautiful thing and the big deal about baptism is this. The most visual demonstration of this whole Tell Me Who I Am series is baptism, the celebration by which Jesus instituted this a couple thousand years ago. It's a great way, the spiritual marker in our lives gives us an opportunity to identify with Christ. When you go under the water, the idea is that you're no longer looking to all these other things for your identity. That, that you're, you're dead to your sin. Coming up out of the water is the reality that Jesus has given you new life. We're going to do baptisms next week, but even if you can't do it next week, I want to encourage you, those of you that know this is the next step, I want you to check the baptism, second one right here, and just write in a date. If you're good to go November 4th, great. Some of you have been waiting all year to do this, and um, if you don't know, we're less than two months till Christmas, all right? All right? Some of you need to make this step. You need to move forward in this. It's an incredible obedience to who Jesus has called us to be and what he's called us to do. And it's this great spiritual marker for you just to go, you know what? I want people to know that Christ has changed my identity. I'm no longer looking to everyone else to save me or to tell me who I am. I've found that, and I want it to be celebrated. So would you guys pray with me? I'm going to ask Brad just to come up and um, just play through one, just one time that song, Tell Me Who I Am. And I want to pray for you, no matter what your relational status is, because this isn't just a relationship still. Uh, this is, uh, hey, we need to find a secure place to root our identity. And so I'm going to pray, and then Brad's going to play. And uh, you just spend some time praying. It's going to be a short little response time. Um, but is there a decision you need to make in light of what you've heard this morning?